Have you ever read Mark's Gospel straight through? I hope you do. It will take less than two hours, even if you read it aloud. If you do that, keep a map of Palestine, as it was in Jesus' day, handy as you read, so you can track Jesus' going and comings. Because in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is very pressured, and there are lots of goings and comings, and sort of a map of them can help you understand what's going on, the same way that if somebody made a map of where you went every day of the week, they would have an idea of what was going on in your life. We can tell there's going to be a lot of pressure in Mark's Gospel because it begins so abruptly, as if there was an announcement over a loudspeaker. See, I'm sending a messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. It's mission go in Israel. And boom, there's John the baptizer preaching near the Jordan. A voice crying out holiness, preaching repentance, calling people to prepare for the one. Almost before we know it, Jesus goes home from, goes from his home in Capernaum on the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee down south to the Jordan River to be baptized. Just as things have for us in the past couple of years, Jesus' ministry is going to challenge him almost relentlessly. Immediately, as Mark likes to say repeatedly, Jesus is pushed into the 40 days in the wilderness where he is tempted by Satan, accompanied by wild beasts, and waited on by angels. When the baptizer is arrested, Jesus goes back to his home in Capernaum to proclaim the good news in Galilee and gathers disciples around him. Follow me, he says. I'll make you fishers of men instead of fishers for food. And do they ever follow him? Not just those fishermen disciples, but people of all sorts from towns all along the lake shore of Galilee. People plagued by an unclean spirit, mothers-in-law who were sick in bed, lepers, a paralyzed man who's let down through the roof, Pharisees and their scribes, and so many tax collectors and sinners that one scribe asked Jesus, why do you let them in the door? Jesus taught and healed and argued and taught and healed and argued and sent his 12 apostles out to do the same. And resistance, questions about what he was doing and why, began almost immediately. When Jesus healed a man's withered hand in the local synagogue, the Pharisees begin conspiring with King Herod's cronies on how they can destroy Jesus because his popularity is booming and it worries them a lot. Such large crowds flock to Jesus that there isn't even room for them to eat and Jesus' own family thinks he's gone mad. Teachers of the law accuse him of using evil to heal people of all things. And when Jesus can't even get into the house where he's teaching, he declared, when Jesus' family can't get into the house where he's teaching, Jesus declares that, well, everybody in there, in, everybody already inside is his family. He's teaching repeatedly with proverbs and parables about how to be faithful to the light God has sent them, how to recognize how even small things may be ultimately significant. And eventually he takes his disciples deep into Gentile country, across the Sea of Galilee, and he is still breaking down barriers of every kind, barriers between Jew and Gentile, male and female, devout and worldly, rich and poor, old and young, well and sick, sane and possessed, politically powerful, and nobody special. But they're all potential messengers of God's good news to God's world. When Jesus heals the daughter of a synagogue ruler, touching the girl, and then cures a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, allowing the woman to touch him, no respected Jewish man would do that. And when he returns home to Capernaum, the members of his synagogue are so offended by his teaching that their negativity cancels out almost all his power. 
Well, Mark says, he did heal a few people by laying on hands. So Jesus shifts into a preaching mission, sending out his disciples to preach repentance. And once again, many are healed. And then John the Baptist is killed, victim of a high court treachery. Jesus and the disciples are swamped by so many people who stay so long beside the lake that it takes a miracle to feed them. And so he sends the disciples out after that, all that work across the Sea of Galilee so he can pray alone. But such a wild storm arises that he has to go and rescue the disciples by walking on water. In other words, as Mark tells it, people recognize Jesus rush to bring their sick to him, beg for permission to touch him and be healed, and you can see how the establishment might be a little bit worried about him, tired of him, ready for him to stop getting so much attention. And we also see how Jesus might be just a little bit worried of it all too, a little bit touchy, a little bit short, definitely ready to get away from the crowd's neediness. We've all had times like that, at least I have. And I particularly remember my dad, who served as a doctor in a small town practice for many years. And on celebratory occasions, we would gather the extended family around the dining table, and dad would say the blessing, and he would take the black pepper that always sat right in front of him and shake it over all the food on his plate, and then the phone would ring. We always answered the phone at our house, and we had a landline, of course. We had three phones, one that even moved to the porch. And so seated, but seated around that big dining table, Dad was the farthest one from the kitchen phone. And so whichever one of us was closest would get up and go pick it up and invariably say, Daddy, it's for you. Well, who else could it be for? The whole family was there. So Daddy would shake his head and say, God darn it. He was just disgusted with fatigue and the need for a little light-hearted celebration with his family. He needed a little personal space and time. You know how that is. I know how it is. And so does Jesus in today's lesson. After all, when today's lesson begins, Jesus had walked something like 35 miles from his home in Capernaum to Tyre on the beach of the Mediterranean coast. It's Gentile, Pharise excuse me, Gentile territory. There are no Pharisees around. It's even outside the tetrarchy of Herod Antipas, so he should have been safe from political enemies. He's gone to the seashore. That's a place for vacation not more work. He's here for a break to get away from all that healing and teaching and dealing with the personalities and religious and political controversies. He wants maybe some time to pray. Maybe to have a glass of wine and a quiet, simple, uninterrupted meal. That's what I would want if I were he and a little bit of sleep and a good book to read. You could say he's had a year or two like our past year or two. You could say he's had a year almost exactly like our last year or two in the sense that controversies and difficulties and arguing, every enmity gets stirred up at the drop of a hat. It's exhausting. It's exhausting for us and it was for him. And so it should be no surprise to us to hear that this tired, hassled Jesus gives a challenging, even grumpy, we might say, answer to the Syrophoenician woman who has just bowed down before him and asked that he heal her daughter. Let the children be fed first, Jesus says, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And bless her, she doesn't take offense. What's better, she doesn't give up. She steps right up in terms of the discussion and make she shoots back straight at him with all the rhetorical strategy. She shoots straight back, challenging him as he had, challenging her, had challenged her with the twist of the metaphor. Sir, even the dogs under the table 
eat the children's crumbs. She knew what he meant. He was sent to announce God's kingdom first to wayward Jews, and that's something she really wasn't. This is the same kind of challenging back and forth that Jesus and the Pharisees would have exchanged in a synagogue, each one on each side, spurring the other to dig deeper in their thinking, holding a metaphor up to the light and turning it to look at it from all angles to search out what's the clearest light that might shine through it. For saying that, Jesus says to her, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. In Mark's gospel, it's not her faith that heals the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. It's her word, her intuitive understanding that Jesus' teaching and presence are inherently barrier-breaking gifts. She is proclaiming to him that every human needs God's care, and she gets it. She's not asking that her daughter take precedence over anyone else, just that her needs be taken seriously. Okay, he says, I get it. Done and done. You can go home now. When Jesus returns to his home in Capernaum, a deaf man's brought to him. And this time things are a little different. Jesus heals up close and personal, and there's no hesitation there. To avoid more controversy, Jesus takes him in private away from the crowd, and he inserts his fingers like sounds into the man's ears. And he takes his own spit like words and puts it on the man's tongues, which is a way of saying, I think, Jesus offers himself. He has been opened to the needs of whoever presents himself. Ephatha, he says, be opened be opened. At the beginning of his work, she said, me. Be opened, he now says. Follow me and be opened. Maybe that's what had happened to him on the coast. That's what we all, no matter where we're from or what group we identify with, we need to be open enough to be Dutch deeply by needs and by Jesus' power. We need to be set free from our demons the way the Syrophoenician's daughter was. Just because they're making us sick, they're controlling our lives, and they're keeping us apart from the community of love. Follow me. Be opened. That's what we need to come home to be opened enough to hear the love in Jesus' voice, to learn his words, to speak and act his love without hesitation. Isn't that what you crave? That presence of God within us, ringing like a singing bowl, ringing through us so that we not only hear the good news, we speak the good news everywhere and all the time. Follow me. Be opened, Jesus says. Let me dwell through you. Be opened. Let my health be your health and pass it on. Be opened. Let my love emerge from you as justice and mercy and humility. Be opened. Act on it. In a, an email from Bishop Brian, a couple of emails actually in the past week or so, both news and inspiration and reconciling thoughts. If you don't get one of those, you can call the church secretary and she can tell you how to get it. He, su he suggests ways that we might respond to those who are suffering from all the crises that are going on around us right now, from the folks in Haiti, in Afghanistan, in, Stan, in the Gulf Coast, and right here in Tennessee. Let my love emerge from you as justice, mercy, and humility be opened. Let my words pronounce welcome wherever you go. Go wherever you need to. Do what's yours to do. Meet some, whoever you want to meet. Learn whatever you want to learn. Argue whatever you want to argue. But let your prejudices and your demons go. Be opened and follow me.